Hello, welcome everybody to this brief lecture here. I'm a professor of computer science at Saarland University, Saarbrücken, Germany. And my background is mostly academic research in planning. So I'm essentially a basic research guy. Here's what I'm going to talk about today. Heuristic search planning. Now that is one of the most prominent sub areas of planning. And obviously I'm going to give you only a very brief overview in the little time I have. So here's the outline of the overview, quite comprehensive, I would say. I'm going to start with why. Why do we want to consider heuristic search planning? Well, one possible motivation is the International Planning Competition, IPC. The first edition was run in 1998. Let me start with the second edition in the year 2000, where the clear winner was based on heuristic search. We followed on a two-year cycle, so the next competition is in 2002. Same picture. Two years later, same picture, except that as of this time point, we were separating satisfying planners from optimal planners. In optimal planning, you are forced to give a guarantee that the plan you return is among the best possible plans. There is no such obligation in satisfying planning. Satisfying planning traditionally attracts uh, the largest competition and that was won by heuristic search. Next competition, same picture. Next competition, same picture. Finally, the most recent competition was run in 2011, so there was a three year gap. And in that competition, heuristic search emerged best in both tracks and actually not only the first places, but the first 12, respectively nine places. Now that might seem very impressive and it is impressive. However, you should not take this too seriously. Okay. First, it's only one part of the IPC, namely the fully automatic deterministic part. There are other parts as well, although this one here is the biggest one. Second, winning the competition doesn't mean you win life. You're just the best planner in one particular setup and according to one particular winning criterion. If you have an actual application, the winner might be different. Finally, Saying the word winner already is not really adequate because these are hugely complex events, very complicated experiments, lots of data and giving you just a single bit somebody won is not a very adequate summary. So really all I'm saying here is that these results should give us sufficient motivation to consider this approach for the 12 minutes of this lecture. Next question I'm going to answer is what, more precisely, what do I mean by heuristic search planning? What is the basic idea? You've already learned about heuristic search in A star. So let me just briefly remind you what we do is a forward search. We start at the initial state. We keep applying applicable actions, generating new reachable states until we've eventually reached the state that satisfies the goal. The number of states we generate might be huge, millions, billions, you name it. So we need a way to direct the search. We do this in terms of a heuristic function H which maps any given world state into an estimate of the distance to the goal for that state. And then we're going to prefer states that appear to be closer to the goal, which of course raises the question, where do we get this magical function from? Now here's the standard example illustrating the standard approach. Let's say our problem is to find the route from Saarbrücken to Edinburgh. What we do is we simplify the problem. In this case here, we might choose to simplify it by just throwing away the map. Okay, now what we do is we solve the simpler problem in order to get our estimate, which in this case here will be the straight line distance. So heuristic functions are computed as the solutions to simplified versions of the problem you're interested in. That raises the question, how are you going to do this in planning? Where your input is not one specific problem, which you can think up the simplification for, instead your input may be any problem. All you get as input is the declarative description of the problem and you need to automatically generate the heuristic function h. How do we do that? Research has so far come up with four ways of doing this. So we got four different families of heuristic functions estimating goal distance and planning. In what follows, I'm going to very briefly give an intuition for each of them. And we're going to start with abstractions and then follow clockwise. Now, before I actually get into this, just to mention that PDB here stands for Pattern Database. 
and MNS stands for Merge and Shrink. I'm not gonna say anything about those, what the differences are, what their specifics are. I'm just gonna illustrate abstractions from a generic point of view. So the standard illustration where it's very easy to see how this works is this puzzle here, the 15 puzzle. The problem is transforming the configuration on the left into the configuration on the right by moving around those tiles and scripted with the numbers from 1 to 15. How do we simplify this problem? Well, what we can do is just ignore part of the description of the problem. So in this case I'm ignoring the part pertaining to the tiles numbered from 8 to 15. Which is a simplified problem, namely a much smaller and easier puzzle. And then I'm just gonna take the distances in that smaller puzzle as my estimates of the distances in the real puzzle that I want to solve. That's already all I'm going to say about abstractions. Next one up, landmarks. For this one I've designed a very simple problem that is easy to understand and illustrate. So the problem here is for me, I'm currently in position 1, to go over to position 7 and get the small key and then carry it all the way back to position 1. Now what is a landmark? A landmark is defined as something that has to be true at some point along any plan. In this case here, for example, at some point along any plan, I am gonna be at any one of those positions, simply because I gotta move across the entire grid. Another thing is, as you see here, position 3 is locked. In order to move across that, I'm gonna have to open it. So this is another landmark. Now in order to open the lock, I need the key, which is the big key, currently in position 2 another landmark. Also at some point, because I have to transport the small key, at some point I'm gonna have to have it in my hand. Now there's quite a few more things we can do here, but let me stop it here. So the intuition is that before planning starts, we somehow automatically detect these landmarks and then they will form the items on the to-do list. And then during search we're just gonna tick off those items and the number of items that are still open is gonna be our estimate. The next one up then are critical path heuristics. You see this is not just one heuristic, it's parameterized. One, two, three and so on. To illustrate I've chosen the traveling salesman problem that I presume everybody is familiar with. So you're on this continent here, your truck is in Sydney, you want to visit all major locations on the continent. How do you simplify the problem? Well the critical path answer is to look at sub-problems of a fixed size. So if you fix the parameter to 1, then what you're looking at is the most expensive one sub-tour, which is saying that you pick the most distant city and just, you know, account for the distance of going there and back. Increasing the parameter to 2, what we're looking at is the most expensive two sub-tour. So the most expensive pair of cities we got to visit. And then you can scale this arbitrarily by just selecting some m subtour and gives, give, that gives you the critical path heuristic parameter m. Now obviously if you choose m to be high enough you'll actually solve the real problem and get an exact estimate. If you decrease m what you get is less accurate estimates but it'll cost you much less computation time. So that's how we trade off computation time against the accuracy of the lower bound we're computing. And that already brings me to the last class called Ignoring Deletes. Now if you're not very familiar with planning, ignoring deletes as a word is not gonna tell you much. So let me translate. Basically what we're doing is, we are simplifying the world by the assumption that anything that was ever true in the past will remain forever true in the future. To illustrate, let's say I move my truck from Sydney to Adelaide. Then afterwards I am at Adelaide because I moved the truck. However, I am also still at Sydney because that's where the truck was before. And thanks to this I can actually move the same truck to two locations in parallel. So in this example here I'm moving it from Sydney to Adelaide and from Sydney to Brisbane and as an effect afterwards my truck is at all, is at all three locations. Now that might seem a little odd indeed. Remember this is not the real world. It's just a simplified world whose only purpose is to compute an estimate of goal distance. So I can keep playing the same game. I can go from Adelaide to the next two locations and as an effect of executing these moves I'm done. 
I have solved the simplified problem, I've visited all locations. Now, it might take a little time to get used to, but if you look at the structure I've built, that's actually kind of obvious. It's the minimum spanning tree approximation. So the way you should read this is, we've got a generic simplification principle, ignoring deletes. We can apply the principle to any input problem. If we happen to apply it to the TSP, the outcome is the minimum spanning tree approximation that we can use to estimate goal distance. But we could apply the same technique to any problem. That is already all I'm going to say about the methods we are using. And what follows, I'm just going to briefly highlight some interesting theory and practice results. For theory, I've chosen to present you an overview of results that were published in a wonderful paper by Malte Helmert and Carmel Domschlag in 2009. Now, no need to worry, I'm not going to take you through this in detail and uh, definitely I'm not going to show you any of the proofs of the properties I show here. Let me just very briefly give you an idea of what it means. So if you look at this notation here, what it is saying is that somehow landmarks are less equal than merge and shrink. What is the meaning of less equal here? It's a kind of simulation property. The intuition is that anything you can do using landmarks, you can just as well do using merge and shrink. More precisely, both are ways of lower bounding goal distance. So each of those techniques returns a lower bounding goal distance. Now what this property is saying is that if you take any example and any lower bound computed using landmarks, you can in polynomial time compute the same or a better lower bound using merge and shrink. Skipping forward to the next notation, the obvious idea here is that this is not so for pattern databases as opposed to merge and shrink. So what this property here says is that there are cases, families of planning tasks and lower bounds computed landmarks that are strictly better than any lower bound you can compute in polynomial time using pattern databases. So much for theory, so this is really just a brief appetizer. For practice I've chosen to show you one of my own results. So what we see on this slide is on the right hand you got a big network, okay, with some sensitive data in it and the network is connected to the web, which this little red devil here is going to exploit. Namely that red devil is going to attack the network. It's going to execute a sequence of exploits leading it to the sensitive data. So basically what we have is a hacking situation. Why is that? a problem, a practical problem we want to solve? Well, imagine you're running this big internet company and you want to make sure this kind of stuff doesn't happen. So outside people who are not authorized do not manage to get at your sensitive data. So what you want is you want to run security checks. One way of doing this is friendly attacks. So you hire some people who will attack your network. If they get through to the sensitive data, you know where you need to work in order to close that gap. The problem is this is not scalable. You got thousands of computers, as you know the domain changes all the time. Every week you get new security patches in Windows and that's because some people invented new attacks and some other people invented new defenses against those attacks. So you're gonna, be have, you're gonna have to run millions of those attacks and ideally you want it to be automatic. And that's exactly what has been achieved using planning. So at this American company called Core Security, in one of their main products, they've got my planner running. So my planner called FF controls this red devil that runs the friendly attacks all the time, automatically. So as we speak, my planner is attacking the networks of some of those big internet companies whose names you're certainly familiar with. And um, that already brings me to the conclusion, which very simply is, if you found this interesting at all, you might want to have a look at my lecture slides. I've just finished teaching a planning course which gives a lot more detail on all this, a comprehensive overview of this sub-area. What you can also do is Google the names of some of the researchers who contributed to the area. And if you're really deeply interested, I just made a little list here with pointers to the literature. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention, for having survived up to this point. I hope you found some of it interesting. 
Enjoy the rest of the course. Bye.